Thank you for joining us tonight for another event in our Securing Tomorrow series with Washington Post columnist David Ignatius. In a moment, he'll be in conversation with Kay Bailey Hutchison, the United States Ambassador to NATO. I'd also like to thank our presenting sponsor, Samsung Electronics America, and a welcome to the stage, Johnny Overcast, the Senior Director of the Samsung Federal Government Team. Hello, welcome to uh, this evening's event. This year marks a 10-year milestone in the era of smartphones, as they have now permanently surpassed PCs as the primary platform for exchanging communication and data. It is also the year in which they have become the primary focal point for cyber attacks. Just last week, the mobile devices of NATO troops stationed in Eastern Europe were the target of organized cyber attacks, and we expect cyber intrusions will continue. Samsung strongly believes that as multinational organizations such as NATO embrace digital transformation on a grand scale, they will also need to evolve their cyber policies and practices to embrace a more rapid deployment, implementation, and procurement process to mitigate new mobile cyber threats. Gone are the days when simple security solutions like antivirus, software, and encryption were enough. Today's more advanced mobile cybersecurity th threats require new solutions such as secure browsers, biometrics, multi-factor authentication, app controls, and context-aware security. Samsung and our partners remain committed to delivering our open, customizable, and defense-grade secure platform, Samsung Knox, as the solution of choice to transform the digital capabilities of the future warfighter. In the inevitable evolution towards a more digital NATO, enabling trusted vendors will ensure the safety of all its member citizens. Thank you very much and have a great evening. Thank you, Johnny. I'd now like to welcome David Ignatius and Ambassador Kay Bailey Hutchison. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll wait for Ambassador Hutchinson. Uh, it's wonderful to know that even on a baseball night, I was going to say we have so many foreign policy fans. This is people uh, think people in Washington don't get it in the world, <laughs> the best baseball game in the history of the city. <laughs> the uh, we're going to get everybody home in time to watch the Nationals. Senator Hutchinson, Ambassador, <laughs> uh, has assured me that she's not against the, Nat, the Nats tonight, although she has a fondness for the Houston Astros. It's really a, a pleasure to welcome all of you uh, to another installment of our Securing Tomorrow series. If you want to be involved in this conversation and ask a question of the ambassador, you can send questions to the hashtag Securing Tomorrow. Uh, this is a, a special pleasure for me. I've known Ambassador Hutchinson uh, formerly senator uh, for many years. Um, she is one of those people uh, who I think of uh, as a Washington problem solver, not problem maker. Uh, it's great to have uh, her as a State Department official uh, now uh, in Brussels as our NATO ambassador. It's great to have her here uh, with us tonight. Um, ambassador, you told me that uh, on your way here you stopped off to see Secretary Tillerson. And uh, as everyone knows, it's been a bumpy couple of weeks for Secretary Tillerson. And I think there's a lot of uh, concern, question about the State Department, uh, where you're now a senior political uh, appointee, and how the State Department is doing. So maybe we could just start there. Just give us a sense of how Secretary Tillerson is doing, what you feel about the department, whether you feel some of these vacancies that have been such a problem are beginning to be filled. Yes, I had a great, I spent pretty much the whole day uh, at the State Department. Uh, it was the very first day of the new Assistant Secretary for European Affairs, which of course will cover NATO as well, Wes Mitchell. He's terrific. And I met with both uh, the Deputy Secretary and the Secretary. And you know, there is a lot going on that is good, that is positive. And, um, I think that the secretary had, I mean, we talked about many of the NATO issues and he was right up on it. He was in great spirits and 
uh, yes, we read uh, these things, and um, you know, I've known him for a long time. He's a Texan, uh, and uh, was a great CEO of Exxon. And I think, um, as he has said, he's not a Washington person, and so I think um, everybody is getting used to the styles and the, the things, but I think in the main, um, I will say that he and the president are working very well on the foreign policy issues with which I'm um, a part, and I am so pleased to be at NATO and to be able to, to tell my colleagues that there is no, there is no space between anyone in our administration, the leaders, the national security team, um, and myself and Congress about our support for NATO. It is a great alliance, and it is so effective now. Um, you know, there was a lull after uh, the Cold War when we thought that things were going to be peaceful in the world and easy. Well, um, it isn't, but NATO has been a glue that has endured through kind of the hard times, and then we had a lull time, but now we're gearing up again. And I am so impressed with, number one, both Republicans and Democrats on the Hill, and every top person in our administration, and especially the president, understands the importance of NATO. And now I think we're going forward in a very constructive way, dealing with a very different set of risks that are common risks to all of our NATO allies. So let, let me ask you the obvious uh, question. You, you said that uh, everybody in the administration supports NATO and the president supports NATO. But uh, we remember during the campaign, the president's pretty sharp uh, criticism of, of NATO for uh, free riding among some countries that weren't p paying their, their full share. Uh, we remember that when he went to speak to NATO in, in May, there was some concern that he didn't mention Article 5, which is the commitment to collective defense. So I just want to ask you um, how you explain uh, this president to your NATO, uh, your NATO counterparts. The, the, you know, so uh, you know, uh, tweets come out later in the day for you because of the time difference, but so you've got a, a fellow NATO ambassador says, uh, uh, Ambassador, could you tell us uh, you know, what to make of it? How, how do you explain that part of the, of, of the administration, the disruptive, it's the president who likes to be the disruptor. How do you explain that to, to folks who are not so keen on disruption? Well, first of all, I think it's to the president's great credit that he knew what he said in the campaign, and then he listened to General Mattis, to Secretary Tillerson, to uh, Secretary General Stoltenberg about what NATO does. And if you didn't have a NATO, and we were out there by ourselves alone, how much harder it would be, how much harder it would be um, in losses, in monetary cost, and in the world coming behind us. So um, I think he pivoted and he appointed me as an ambassador knowing that I know NATO and what it does and he appointed a Secretary of Defense and a Secretary of State um, as well as a National Security uh, Advisor uh, who all have been very strong NATO uh, supporters. And I think he thought it through, and I think that uh, I think that speaks for itself. Um, you know, I think early on, before um, uh, it was clear that um, we were going to remain a strong NATO leader, we are the leader of NATO, um, and. When I go and visit, and as I mentioned to you, I am making now a mission of going to each ambassador's office and meeting with them one-on-one, -on -one, nobody in the room, um, in their offices. And they all say, we know that we need to do more. We know that we need to do what we've committed to do, the 2%. 
plus 20% in capability, and they are making an effort, and we have increased. Um, I think the president's pushing uh, has helped that, and we have had increases across the board in the full funding of NATO itself, but also, which, by the way, no one is delinquent on the NATO dues. I hope that is clear. Uh, but on the added 2% defense expenditures, and uh, that's what we're pushing for so that we have a bigger collective pool for our common defense. And the other area where I think the president has been very effective is on making counterterrorism one of NATO's uh, missions, one of its uh, most important missions. Uh, the Russian aggression uh, has been on the radar screen for a long time, and it still is. But in addition to that, counterterrorism is now, now a major mission, and I credit uh, the Secretary General for listening to uh, President Trump saying, we want counterterrorism because it is a common threat to all of us to be addressed by NATO, and it is going to be. I come back to the counterterrorism mission and, and how that uh, might work, but just to ask a little bit more about, about how you uh, explain uh, this president uh, to our, our, our NATO partners. Uh, it's interesting that you say that he's pivoted in his own view about the importance of NATO, but an example of what uh, causes concern at home and abroad both is when there's a comment uh, that uh, pointing to his uh, military leadership at a dinner party, this is the calm before the storm. And everybody thinks, well, oh, what's the storm? A and uh, are, are, are troops uh, being moved? Are ships at sea being uh, relocated? I'm sure you get questions uh, about this. That was a, a statement uh, that was provocative. How, how do you answer that when people say, um, what does calm before the storm uh, mean, Madam Ambassador? Well, I I will tell you, no one has asked me that question. <laughs> well, so, <laughs> I'm asking you now. <laughs> I know you are, but, um, but you know, I think people understand the political arena. The all, 29 ambassadors have all been in the political arena or they've been appointed uh, by a president. And I think they understand that there are uh, different political um, constituencies that everybody has to address. And so I, I think people are understanding of different ways of communicating, their understanding of different constituencies in countries. And um, you, you might think that people say, oh, you know, what, what's that about? Or they don't, they really don't. I mean, we talk about our issues and we talk about um, what America's position is on, for instance, we did a very strong statement uh, condemning North Korea, um, and we negotiated that. Uh, the same for the nuclear ban treaty, uh, which everyone in the alliance, it was unanimous, uh, said it was a mistake to sign that treaty because we now have the only deterrent for a rogue nation that is clearly testing ballistic missiles and nuclear weapons. And the time for being a deterrent with a nuclear weapon is absolutely right now. And our alliance understands that. So that's, uh, that's what we're focused on. Since you, you mentioned uh, North Korea, I, I, I wanted to ask you, um, the North Koreans have um, made uh, uh, <coughs> provocative, incendiary threats. They've been testing missiles and nuclear weapons, uh, both. And there has been a question if the North Koreans should um, uh, make an attack on U.S. territory, uh, even as far away as Guam, uh, whether the United States would turn to its NATO allies and say, our territory has been attacked, and invoke uh, Article 5, the, the common defense 
uh, 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 commitment that's at the core of, of NATO. Would you as ambassador, if in the unlikely, I hope, uh, event that we were attacked by North Korea, would we seek to invoke that collective defense commitment from, from NATO? I think, David, there are so many steps that would have to be taken before we would get to that point. And it would depend on what kind of attack it is, where it is. Um, it would depend on whether uh, that was uh, something that the United States would want. Um, you know, there have been some different circumstances where, um, well, like for instance, after the French terrorist attack, um, that it was discussed, is this an Article 5? But France never asked because they really didn't think that was the best approach. And so I, I think it, you just can't, um, you can't have a hypothetical on Article 5. You have to know what it is. And I'm told, um, Nick Burns, one of the former ambassadors, um, I'm told by him, you know Nick uh, as well, um, that the night of 9-11, um, that there was a groundswell, that it wasn't initiated by America. And he was getting the calls, this is an Article 5. Do you want a, a council Article 5? And he called Condi Rice in the middle of the night um, and you know the hours difference, the seven hours difference, and he said, "I'm being inundated with offers to do Article Five. What do you think?" And she said, "Yes, yes, do it." But it was a question, and she said yes, and it's the only time Article Five has ever been used. So, and and you know when you talk about, are we committed to NATO? The only time Article 5 has ever been used was when NATO said, this is a war against all of us. Uh, and before we leave uh, this question of North Korea, I'm, I'm curious whether uh, the subject uh, comes up in your NATO ambassadorial discussions, whether you get uh, questions from your colleagues, whether we share, even though it's out of area, uh, discussion of of military issues that arise uh, because of the North Korean threat? You know, it's, a, it's just beginning. When North Korea tested the ICBM, the long-range ballistic missile, which, when you look at a map, it covers Europe, too. I mean, it could, if it were effective and if it were in a good missile. That type of missile could cover all of Europe as well as uh, the western part of the United States. And that began then a discussion uh, about North Korea as a threat. It's not anything that has developed yet because I think Kim Jong-un has been so clear that it's making trouble for America. I mean, that's his tar target right now. But I think the, the ambassadors now at NATO, and I, I think everyone is beginning to say, um, this is something we need to look at, we need to start talking about, because the complication is that if you start looking at North Korea as a common threat, which we believe it is a common threat, we believe that if this becomes a successful possibility, it's not going to be just America. Um, it will be a, a much more um, problematic uh, uh, situation. And I think that is beginning to, to come to the forefront. But I think that it it becomes a complicated issue because if you start doing a missile defense, which we have, uh, we have one in Alaska, we have missile defense, and we don't, but Japan has a missile defense system now, um, and South Korea. Um, but all of our missile defenses in Europe are toward the Middle East. If you start 
putting it toward North Korea, then it starts beginning to be um, an issue for some of our treaties that would not allow that. So all of that is in the very early stages of being discussed. What are the issues? But decisions, no. But issues, yes, it's beginning. It's, uh, it's interesting that the, that the discussions uh, have, have begun. So let me turn to um, an issue that's going to preoccupy us um, over the next uh, weeks uh, anyway, and, and maybe well beyond that. And that is the question about the Iran nuclear agreement and the president's reported plan to decertify uh, that under the congressional uh, requirement that every 90 days he certifies. It's said that he's not going to do that this time, which will, in effect, uh, kick this issue to Congress and will raise questions, um, uh, certainly in Europe, uh, about the status of the agreement, the status of America's commitment. I'm sure you're already getting questions from uh, your European counterparts uh, asking for explanations of what uh, the administration's policy is. How are you answering those questions now? And help us to, to think about what this administration wants, the message it wants to send, and the messages it doesn't want to send. Yes, um, there is a lot of questioning about that, uh, because the Europeans uh, are part of that agreement. Uh, many of them are. And so they are wondering. Uh, just in uh, the news that has been out there. And um, so I don't know yet. I think there is an announcement. There's a deadline, I think October 15th. So we're right on that deadline. And I think there will be um, uh, something, a decision. And um, I am looking at what is being said. Um, in the preparations. And I think the, um, the certification that Congress has put forward um, is an area that probably needs to be uh, looked at. Maybe there were some things that could be more clear about what is necessary for a certification. So I think that's something. And then I think. Uh, what Secretary Tillerson said about the purpose of the agreement, um, in addition to the actual nuclear, uh, the uh, not pursuing the nuclear weapon and having the ability to discern if the that part of the, which was the core of the agreement, is being met. But the purpose was to uh, provide uh, peace and stability in the region. And that, that is stated in the agreement as one of the purposes for it. And I think the concern is that Iran is not contributing to peace and security in the region. They are uh, funding uh, terrorist groups. They are. Uh, being a part of the problem in Syria, certainly not helpful. Same for um, Hezbollah, Hamas. Um, and so I think the things that Iran is doing, and then they're testing a ballistic missile, um, those are all things that uh, I think are a great concern to the president and to his whole national security team. And so all of that is going to have to be factored in. So I, I hear European ambassadors, um, other uh, <clears throat> foreign officials express that same concern about Iranian behavior uh, in the Middle East. And it's widely seen as destabilizing. But I often hear people follow that up by saying, so for goodness sakes, don't take the one element that, that we've managed to stabilize, namely the nuclear uh, threat and, and throw that back on, on, on the table, uh, that will make, will make it harder to deal with this regional problem. I'm sure, again, I'm sure you've heard that same argument from, from uh, European officials. It's, it's widely felt. It is, it, I think what they want is some reassurance that that 
is not going to be overturned in this in this process. That the president is not, in fact, going to walk away from 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 the deal. Uh, do you, again, I'm curious how you answer that that question. I'm sure you get uh, every day. Well, it's hard because I don't know. I don't know the real answer. I mean, I don't know what the president's going to do. Um, I know that his team has been looking at it, and he's, they've had a lot of discussions. They're not, they're not doing anything precipitously, I know that, because there is, there is a lot of um, talk about it, and uh, Secretary Tillerson has talked about it uh, publicly on the points that uh, no one is happy with. And, our allies aren't happy with Iran's behavior either. But um, I think you have correctly raised the questions that people are asking. I don't know the answer, but I know what issues are being looked at and being a part of a decision. Well, we will we'll, we'll come back to you uh, in, in maybe in 24 hours or, or next week or whatever this is finally announced. It has been a long, uh, long time. Uh, it's a long wind-up. We'll see what, we'll see see what, what the pitch is uh, for tonight's metaphor. Um, so to, to <laughs> ask you about another thing I spent the day uh, thinking about and writing a column about, about for tomorrow, and that's Turkey. Uh, Turkey is a, is a NATO member. We often say Turkey, <laughs> our NATO ally, but it's been a, a, a pretty complicated and difficult uh, NATO ally recently. A um, very dramatic uh, sign of that last week was the arrest of a um, uh, longtime official of the U.S. consulate in, in Istanbul, uh, who was uh, in, in jailed now. Um, you deal with your Turkish counterpart uh, all the time in Brussels, and I'd be interested in, in what uh, that optic uh, tells you about, uh, about Turkey. Uh, whether there's any change in, in your NATO uh, relationship. Um, uh, so g give us a snapshot of your uh, dealing with Turkey as NATO ally. Well, Turkey, there is, um, there's so much at, at stake here. There are so many issues with Turkey, uh, many more than We've, we've had in the past. Uh, we've never had this kind of um, uh, trouble. And I think buying the Russian ballistic missile defense um, was also another um, issue on the table. Um, if if people don't, the, so uh, Ambassador Hutchinson is referring to the Turkish Decision. I don't know if it's it's a, a gone through and f to to it acquire has. a Russian uh, air defense system, um, uh, which led some people to ask: Is that compatible with NATO membership? To, if you're so, what, what about that? Yeah, it's it's been very troublesome uh, in NATO um, because it won't be it'll not be interoperable with the NATO uh, ballistic missile systems, the defense. And um, so it's a problem. On the other hand, Turkey is one of our key partners in Afghanistan. Uh, they are the head of one of the TAC units. Uh, and they have been a, an effective ally in many ways. And I, if, if I had a tablet, I would put 10 things that is bad in our relationship with Turkey and 10 things that are great. And it's very hard um, to, to maneuver in this. But Turkey is so important for a Muslim democracy uh, that we want to help succeed. We want to have a, a, a secular government in a, in a Muslim country that can be shown to uh, be an ally which they've been a, a strong ally of NATO in the past. The, it's becoming harder, and I think after the coup attempt um, on Erdogan, President Erdogan, things have gone awry in many directions. That was a huge uh, 
uh, shock, and it, and it was a terrible thing. And and there and there has been a you know a clampdown on on the people that are suspected, and that has also been another issue that. Um, the president thinks that there is a person in America that it has been a part of it, but there's been no evidence to show that. Uh, so all of these things are in a mix. But on the bottom line, Turkey has been a good ally, and they have been a valuable ally. And it is something that I would like to see us try to work through and keep as an ally. Um, Turkey also has big problems with Europe, with the EU. They never got into the EU. And I, I think with the situation there now, with the, um, the clampdown that we've seen on the press, on the uh, freedom of speech, that that would be very hard now. Uh, and so all of these things are completely piling to make it worse when really I hope we can make it better. I want to have Turkey as an ally. I want them to be in NATO. They have a unique voice as a Muslim democracy that uh, if it succeeds could be important for the long term. But it is complicated. Uh, and I, I'm just curious, in this period, uh, as you say, of, of an unusual number of issues and difficulties. Has there been any change in uh, the NATO um, uh, relationship in, in terms of the, the, the kind of details, movements in and out, um, uh, procedures at Inshalek and other, other bases in Turkey that are, that are, that are used? Any, anything that, that's different in this period of tension? Um, there's been no effort to change in Sirlik. Um You know, we have, in addition to all the things we've already talked about, there is a difference on the Kurd issue. Um, the Turks are very worried about um, the, the Kurds, both Syria and Iraq. Um, and we, the Kurds have been great allies of, of America, not allies, but they've been, um, they've been very, honest and straight with, with America about their position in Iraq. They, they have been so productive in Iraq. The Kurdistan part of Iraq is, is doing really well. And um, so I think that but the Turks don't like that. And so that's been another issue. And um, so that affects that border. And I think they haven't done anything direct, except now we know they have arrested, the government has erect, arrested a uh, Turkish citizen who works in our embassy that is, has been a good employee in our in, embassy, and that's just another um, issue. I mean, count them, there are just so many, but they haven't suggested anything about Inserlik, and we've been great military partners. The military to military um, has been really good in Turkey. Buying this Russian defense system has, you know, it's going to cause problems, that's for sure. But we're trying very hard to keep them close because they have been valuable. We want them to be valuable. We don't want them to start getting close with Russia, that's not in our interest, and it's not in their interest. So we're working through it. That's, that's a, a helpful um, answer, um, and we'll, we'll stay Muddled. focused. Um, the, uh, the, I know there's a, a mission that's heading out to Turkey next week from the State Department to try to talk through some of these problems. Uh, I have on our hashtag Securing Tomorrow a question and just so people will know that we actually do look at these, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put it to you, although I'm not sure it's, it's at the top of your agenda. Um, the, the, the question is whether you, as our ambassador, will advocate for Macedonia, 
trying to remember the precise name that we used from Estonia, to become the 30th member of NATO. Um, and more generally, uh, I think that question carries the really fascinating issue of NATO expansion, an issue that is, as uh, the Russians uh, keep reminding us, they regard as, as threatening. So Macedonia, A, but then on the, on the broader question, is, is, is NATO now a completed alliance, or should we imagine that there's a future in which other countries might be added? Well, we have an open door policy uh, at NATO, and y you have to meet standards. You have to meet standards of democracy, and um, you have to have a certain military capability. And, you know, the debate, David, you're going to remember this, but the debate probably 10 or 15 years ago was do we keep NATO small and compact and strong? Or after the breakup of the Soviet Union, do we reach out to the other countries um, and bring them in, even though that has a risk of then getting into a war with Russia? So which would be the best way? And the decision was made to have the open door policy and to bring in the Balkans and the Baltics. And to have standards that would make them stronger. And what won the debate is that if we could have a standard of democracy and a standard of a military self-help and an understanding of a constitutional government, that those countries would be more able to defend themselves and last as democracies for the long term. And so the open door policy won the argument, rather than keeping it at 13 or 14, um, that it would go to now 29. And the open door is still there, and the requirements are still there. Macedonia is the next one that could meet the test, and I do support Macedonia. The problem is the name Macedonia has got to be acceptable uh, to Greece. And because of that disagreement, there's not a unanim there's not a unanimous vote. Um, but I think everyone um, is watching Macedonia and it's in its uh, requirements, and it is meeting those tests. It has a little bit to go, but I do think Macedonia, if they can, they say they're close to an agreement on having a name, and you would want them to be able to have the name they want in some form. Um, but they have to have a unanimous consent, and that is the sticking point right now. But I think they're very close. The uh, United States does support them. And I think if they can get that last domestic piece together and keep working toward that free election, um, and a uh, strong government that they will be the next member. So uh, the Russians um, a few weeks ago gave uh, their answer to this question of um, uh, what do you think about a, uh, expanding uh, NATO that moves closer and closer to Russia's borders. Uh, and their answer was a, an unusually aggressive military exercise, which they called Zapad. Uh, and uh, you've had a chance, I'm sure, to study that in detail with your NATO colleagues. And uh, give, give us your uh, readout uh, from a military, political military perspective on that exercise. Did, did you and your colleagues see uh, new weapon systems, new technologies, uh, new uh, operating procedures that concerned you? Um, did it raise questions, sort of gut-level questions uh, for NATO uh, about the nature of the Russian potential threat? Yes. Um, I will say, first of all, that Russia did not meet the standards of the Vienna Agreement, that they would be transparent. All of us agreed that um, if there were any exercises that would be more than 13,000 uh, participants, that there would be um, 
a transparency and that there would be observers allowed to be there. Well, it was a whole lot more than 13,000 uh, in Zafad. And what's, what's, what's the estimate of, of how many uh, were involved? Oh, I don't have numbers, but it was in the tens of thousands. <laughs> so, um, so Russia did not meet the requirements of the Vienna Agreement. Um, having said that, it was an impressive show of uh, a very um, um, expansive command structure. And it was, uh, it was a big show. There was no doubt about it. Now, our, our people were watching from where we could. You know, there was intelligence the whole time to make sure, because remember, when the Russians took over Crimea, it was like that, and it was during, it was right after one of these exercises. They just massed on the border, they were just doing an exercise, and they took Crimea. So that's why we were watching, and um, the NATO intelligence was very um, uh, strong, and we also brought it up, and there's a NATO-Russia council where uh, you can bring up issues. We can bring up issues. Russia can bring up issues. We, NATO, and Russia. And we brought up the lack of transparency in Zapad. The, oh, no, no, there's nothing that's going on that's um, of any um, import. We're just seeing, we're just testing our systems, you know. And they did. Um, and it was an impressive show. But we were watching very carefully to see if there was any kind of a buildup that could be leaving uh, equipment there, those kinds of things. And um, it, it passed, and there was nothing. But it was, it was a big so show. So they, they, they have packed up and, and gone home, as, as it were. There, there was concern that um, this forward deployment for the exercise might persist, Something. and but have you established now that, as I say, they've uh, taken the forces back from from where they were? I can't say specifically that I know what what has been taken back, but our people have been watching, and they're not concerned about something happening from this. Now, just in the last day or so, Russia has accused uh, uh, NATO of um, having uh, a buildup in their territory that looks to them to be like, you know, maybe we're doing something um, because we have troops in Poland, which we've been very clear about and transparent about, and it's a rotation and the rotation just happened. And so they're saying that all these new troops are coming in, and that's a violation of uh, the agreement that we have on troop buildups. Well, it's not an add-on. It's a, um, a rotation. So um, we're hoping to clear that up. But they're now saying, well, if you're going to do that, then we need to put more systems into Kal Kal Kaliningrad, which is that little place that they have that's, um, it's not in the main Russian territory, but it's this little piece that they kept when the Soviet Union broke up that is uh, on the other side of Poland. So uh, that's a little dust up. I don't think it's going to be anything, but those are the things that you know, keep there, there, You hear um, from uh, East Europeans, especially from the Baltic states, that the, to be really credible as an alliance, uh, NATO needs a, a firmer tripwire, uh, more of an enhanced forward deployment. Isn't that the term of art that you're using now? Mm -hmm. um, so that if the Russians ever got any ideas about doing something uh, in the Baltic states, they would in encounter American troops that have to be in a, in a showdown with us. Do, do you have a view about, about that question, about whether uh, to make 
NATO more credible, we need to have a little more uh, oomph uh, forward, not on a rotating basis, but on a, on a permanent basis? I think the rotation is working very well. And we, we have beefed up in the, all three Baltic states um, our rotational forces. And they're, they are doing, what they are doing is more um, planned, coherent, combined um, uh, exercises. And all within the Vienna Treaty, I will say, because uh, they are under the 13,000. But the troops that are there are doing exercises that are much more serious than have been done before. But the rotations um, are, are working well, and the competency level and the cohesion level is, is very much enhanced. So, and, and as a matter of fact, uh, the President Trump increased the European Assurance uh, Initiative, which is now called the European Deterrence Initiative, which puts more capability. He increased the budget, President Trump in his budget, increased the, the budget for enhanced forces in Poland and the Baltics. Uh, and then other places where they might be needed on that border if they're, um, you know, like Romania, or places that are right across the Black Sea from um, Crimea, where they're, you know, we're just watchful. And so I think there is an enhanced presence, a much more focused presence, and a better training. Uh, of, of the troops, but I think that uh, the rotational as opposed to a permanent um, is so no, more efficient. no change contemplated in, in that. Not so I, I've been asking about the conventional Russian military threat, but as, as we saw uh, in Crimea uh, and then have been seeing in eastern Ukraine, uh, the uh, approach the Russians seem to be using uh, now is is different. It's not main force units, mm -hmm. tanks rolling across borders, the kind of thing that NATO as an alliance was really created uh, to deal with. Mm -hmm. It's it's something different, which we, we're calling hybrid warfare or little green men. But the, the idea is that war, as the Russian strategists see it, is no longer binary. It's not on or off. The tanks roll across the border or they don't. Uh, it's, it's a sliding scale, and it includes all the instruments of national power. It includes uh, cyber attacks. It includes influence operations, which uh, our uh, Senate Intelligence Committee, House Intelligence Committee, are, are looking at uh, carefully now. Uh, I want to ask you, it, uh, if that's the heart of the threat that Russia really does pose now, uh, I often think that NATO isn't really very well configured to deal with it. NATO is a military alliance. It's about hardware and troops. It's not an intelligence organization, really. So what, what, what about that? It, it, it is, it, if, if hybrid warfare is the, is the threat, um, has NATO p positioned itself properly? And, and what more should it do to deal with that real-world problem? It is a real-world problem. The hybrid warfare, malign influence, the things that Russia is doing are very um, long-term. They're trying to break down the bonds of the NATO alliance by um, putting out false news, putting out there was a, a false story that um, a NATO soldier had raped a, a girl. It was made up. And things that would cause people in the area to not like NATO, places that Russia might be able to influence. Uh, you saw it uh, in the 
the efforts uh, to, in the elections, the elections in Germany, the elections in France, the elections in America. Those are malign influences of, of uh, false stories in news. The French, um, they had, they have a uh, moratorium on news for, is it 24, 48 hours, I think. It's two days. Yes. 48 hours. Before the election. And there was a huge Russian effort to create a big scandal on uh, President Macron. Well, he wasn't president at the time, uh, Mr. Macron. Um, a huge scandal that wasn't true, but they had that moratorium, and the big question, the ethical question was, oh my gosh, we've got this terrible, you know, it's a story about Macron, you know, maybe with some um, uh, illicit use of campaign money or something like that. And so the news media talked about, should we keep the moratorium or not? And they decided to keep the moratorium. And that saved Macron from having a false story blown up at the last minute that then um, could be refuted. Um, and so I think you look at something like that, and it happens that they got by with it. They tried that in the German elections, and we now know that they tried it in our elections. So I think that they are, they're playing the long game. And the long game is to break the bonds of NATO and our alliances and to cause uh, friction and um, to go in and, and do something like getting Turkey to buy a ballistic missile defense uh, that is in, not in ability, there's no ability to have an interoperable system with NATO now, so there are going to be walls built, and that's Russia's goal. It's amazing uh, how sophisticated they've become, and NATO does know it, and we are. We are beginning now to work on information systems, sharing. Uh, when some of these things are coming up, we're bringing it up uh, as an issue in the next NATO Russia Council, uh, so that they know that we know what they're doing, we know the false news, and we're also setting up um, some intelligence and uh, cyber uh, defense. Um, so we are in the stages of adapting to a very new type of warfare. In addition to different types of enemies, this new kind of warfare um, and the hacking into phones in Poland uh, and other countries. It's something that we are beginning to understand and look, looking at defenses to deal with it. Glad to hear you uh, answer that question so forthrightly. I, I, it's one of the most direct, emphatic statements about Russian meddling. Uh, in Europe and in our elections that I've, I've heard from a, an administration uh, official. So, so th thank you for speaking to that. I want to ask you, um, as we get toward the end of our conversation about Afghanistan, uh, you just have been uh, in Afghanistan with uh, Secretary Mattis. Um, uh, Afghanistan is, among other things, a, a, a NATO commitment. And you've been quoted as saying that you'd like to see NATO add 1,000 troops as we add uh, 3,000 or so to bulk up that force. And uh, to ask the question that Senator McCain has been uh, asking pretty aggressively over the last few weeks uh, on Capitol Hill, um, what's the plan that the administration has um, to uh, use the additional resources in Afghanistan to get a different outcome. We've been at this for 16 years. Are 4,000 more troops really going to get us uh, to a goal that uh, 
we didn't achieve when we had 100,000. Um, uh, how do you answer that? Well, I'm sure you've got some skeptical um, uh, NATO colleagues, just as they're skeptics on Capitol Hill. You know, I think this new Afghanistan plan has a chance to succeed. I think it is very innovative. And when our ambassadors uh, talked about it after it came out, it was universally acclaimed because the conditions-based exit, um, everybody knew that it was a mistake to put a hard deadline. They knew the Taliban would wait. They did, and the Taliban came back with stronger force when we left at the end of 2014. And I think conditions that are the, uh, the exit strategy are important because it means we're staying until the job is done. That has emboldened the Afghan leaders. And here's what's different. Both Ghani and Abdullah Abdullah were in our meeting, and they made commitments for reform that would give a stronger basis of government, that would attack the corruption. They're bringing new, younger, educated people into the cabinet. The new Secretary of Defense, the new Secretary of the Interior, whose sole purpose is to attack corruption in the country because the drug cartels are paying, um, and that's, that is financing the Taliban. And so you see that new, younger generation coming up. There is now a mandatory retirement age for the military. It used to be 70, now it's 62 for generals, and it's down to 58 for the lower level officers. So those older generals are moving out, and those younger, educated uh, military um, people are seeing that they have a way to move up. President Ghani said, our people are willing to fight for our country. There are 300,000 in the Afghan army now. And when we went out to the outpost to meet with the uh, NATO units, uh, American units as well as Italy, Turkey, Germany, very mixed Polish units, um, they said the Afghan fighters are good. They, are, they fight differently from us, but they know what they're doing, and they're good, and they are committed and they've had heavy losses, but they're still out there. They see that with the new strategy of regionalizing to make sure that Pakistan and India are going to be helpful. Uh, Pakistan um, has uh, not been as helpful as they could. They've been helpful in some areas, but not others. Um, now, they see a different, they see a different uh, Taliban effort since our new uh, strategy went into force. And when we brought back more air power to, it's the Afghans who are fighting, it's not Americans. The Americans are advising and they're training. And so are the NATO forces. Uh, but. It's the Afghans who are on the ground, and we are giving them advice and counsel and training, and they're, they're good now. And the air cover has scattered the Taliban. And so they're seeing a, a different Pakistan. Pakistan is doing some things now that they hadn't done before that were good, that are good. Um, India is really stepping up. I, we cannot say enough about how much India is doing. And the Afghan people like the Indian people. They've been, they've been there. They have invested in education and um, infrastructure. And the Afghan people trust them. And they've said they'll step up and do more. And so I think the regionalization, the conditions-based exits, and the younger generation coming in, and President Ghani and Abdullah, the two rivals, both saying two things. 
We are committed to reform in our government. We are committed to fighting corruption. And the Afghan people are going to fight for our own country. Those are the differences, and it's making a difference already. Um, that's, uh, again, as clear an explanation of what we're trying to do as, as, uh, as I've heard. So I promised everybody we'd get you home for the ball game. <laughs> and First I thing. just want to say in, in closing, um, uh, there's a lot of uh, concern in, in Washington that President Trump was uh, against the globalists and the globalists were the danger and you know, you don't sound to me like um, uh, you're you're gonna, you know, uh, uh, fight those terrible globalists. You you sound uh, a little bit like somebody who uh, believes in our traditional alliances and the structure of American power. And uh, uh, you and I have known each other a long time. I really in, in enjoy having you here. I think we all learned a lot, and we wish you good luck in Brussels. Well, I want to tell you, it's a team. It's really a team. Uh, it is.